Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. My name is Scott Morgan off the Motor City Madmouth, along with my co-host tonight, leading off in, in first base up in Jacksonville, Florida, up I-95 North. Five hours is David Levin. David, how you doing? How you doing tonight, guys? Everybody doing all right? Uh, doing great. And... Uh, and the uh, and my next co-host is up in Wellington, Florida, not far away from our Corp Coral Springs headquarters. And we welcome aboard Stuart Hack. How you doing tonight? Hey, how you doing? Just horsing around here. Oh yeah, we are. Had a great first sports exchange, and expect tonight to even be more fun since we're going to be talking about diamond viewings. And with that said, okay, David, uh, what do you got to ask, Mister Hack Attack? Well. We're getting closer to the baseball season. Uh, teams are already in their practice facilities, whether it's at their training facilities that they held for spring training or in their uh, actual stadiums. And I was wondering, now that you've had a chance to see how this is developing, uh, do you think this is going to eventually be something really good this season, even though it's 60 games? You know, it, I still think it's too I don't think we're going to know until the last day of the season what this is because at any time, I, I think something can come up. You know, this is unprecedented. You think you're seeing some of the cases, some of the positive cases for the coronavirus are coming up now, and you're thinking, all right, they're getting it out of their system, but it could it could still happen. You know, to other players once the season mm -hmm. gets going, and I don't think you could take a breath until the last game of the World Series. And I think they'll get there. With, you know, the, the teams have expanded rosters, so there'll, there'll be backups and, you know, when people, there'll be people going, I guess, on the disabled list for a variety of reasons. But I feel, you know, they'll get through it. But what, it, what the 2020 baseball season will be probably won't be determined until it's over. Speaking of the coronavirus and people, you know, either have been tested positive for it. I know that in the, what was it? The Marlins themselves, and I only go based on, on what I read because I covered them. There were four players that tested positive, but they didn't, you know, they weren't telling us who it was, but you can kind of pick it out based on what you see. You know, Mike Trout is still kicking it around whether he wants to play or not. How really important is it to have big name stars play this year? You know, it's, 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 it's it is important, but you have to respect their wishes. You can't force a Mike Trout to go and play because he's Mike Trout. You know, if he's not comfortable, you, you, he shouldn't go out there because he's not, right. if he's not comfortable, he's not going to play like Mike Trout. So he's got to be 100% comfortable with the situation and go out there. And I said it last week, you know, if a lot of big names end up not playing or, or God forbid getting sick, and what baseball's got to do is they got to start promoting whoever is playing. You know, you can't worry about who's not there. Just deal with who is there and make the most of it. I think that's what they just got to sit down and do. You know, and, you know I, I agree with what you're saying. The NFL for years, and the NBA to some extent, when you had teams that were perennial losers, you know, uh, the Jaguars or, or the Browns or in the NBA it would be, I don't know, the Atlanta Hawks or some other team that you know, never made the playoffs. You always promoted, well, you're going to get to see this star play and you're going to get to see this guy come in and play. I'm concerned that that's what's going to become of it, that we're not promoting the home team, we're promoting the guy that's coming in town that basically kick your butt. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the other thing you have to look at too is well, most of these games aren't going to be played with fans. You know, the Mets, the Mets announced today um, for fans that are renewing for 2021, they will be allowed to have cardboard cutoffs of them in the stands for 2020. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know how much I don't know how much they're charging the fans for their cardboard cutouts. You know, the Mets need all the help they can get. I go to football games and I see people with bags over their heads to begin with. So that's oh, all the way that different. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's yeah. fantastic. Well, David, if you're going to say that, are you going to just sit here and talk about the Jaguars saying tarps do? It might as well go all the way, right? Come on, David. No, we've seen it. No, but I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback that now. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Okay. You, you opened it. You opened that can. The, no, uh, you Baltimore opened it. The, ba the Baltimore Ravens are going to cap, I believe it's 14,000 seats for this season where they're they're less you know they're trying to keep up with their social distancing and they're still trying to I guess get fan revenue to come in um, how, do you 
see Major League Baseball possibly doing the same thing. Remember, the parks are smaller. So 14,000 people in a 35,000 seat stadium is half almost. Do you see Do you see Major League Baseball maybe taking the ball with that and running with it? You know, for this season... I think it's gonna. It would be way less, or, or even nothing, because just because it's starting right. sooner, you know. The right. hope is when the NFL starts, you know, maybe things will clear up a little bit, and they can go to twenty, thirty percent mm-hmm. capacity for those stadiums. But for Major League Baseball, they're going to be playing games in two weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And it's it's going to be empty. Have you been able to see? I was watching something on on the major uh, MLB channel. I'm sorry, where uh, all the media has been spread out. they got to be in certain areas to cover. I'm so worried that you're going to see like little dots on the field if you're watching from home. And all you're going to see is, you know, a, a dot here, a dot there, a dot there. They should just leave it empty to begin with and not even play around with it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to be a different experience, and I don't I don't think anybody from fans to players to broadcasters to writers anybody really knows what they're going to expect until they actually see it. And there'll be a and there'll be a curiosity. It'll almost be like you know when when the USFL started or when the XFL started. There was a curiosity the first week or two, and then you know the success of it will be the ability to keep people and reel them in. You know, game after game, week after week. If they can do that, then they could be somewhat successful. But they'll they'll get a good TV audience the first week because there's going to be a curiosity. People are going to want to see what this looks like. Do you see upside down ratings possibly to television? And I mean that because of the possibility that a small market team catches lightning in a bottle and is able to, you know, win 30, 35 games. Let's say for the sake of argument, the Yankees fall flat, which I know they're not, but, you know, the Yankees or the Red Sox or somebody that is always going to, you know, blue blood falls flat and, and you see an inverse of attention? You know, you could. It, I don't think it would happen right away. It would happen really towards the end of the year when the playoffs mm-hmm. start taking shape. Like, the end of August, I don't think anyone, you know, if the Marlins are in the playoff race, I don't think it's going to bring them any extra national attention, you know, maybe a little bit more attention down in South Florida. But, you know, once the playoffs start and the World Series, you know, it's really up to Major League Baseball to promote this because if a team like the Marlins or the Royals, like we mentioned last week, are, are playoff contenders, their best players, most of the nation probably has never heard of. So mm-hmm. it's up to Major League Baseball to get their names out, to find backstories on them, make them compelling, make people want to tune in and, and turn on the TV and watch them. Right. You know, ma- whoever's in Major League Baseball's advertising and marketing, they, they're really going to have to work overtime to you know to get interest in, in all this. You know, something, you know, if the Yankees are, are, are in it like they're expected to, they won't have to work as hard because a lot of people know the Yankees and know they're supposed to be good. But by the same token, it may be a little boredom there. Maybe the best thing is for, say, the Yankees and the Marlins to be a, the World Series team. So you have one established team and then you have one long shot. Hmm. And then you have the David, David versus Goliath matchup. And then we well, yeah, just that in 2003, you know, right, which right. was so compelling, right? And no one thought the Marlins would win, and they just they, they did, right? Jeez. I don't know how I want to say this, so I'm going to just I'll, I'm going to kid question you basically. You're watching the game, and you're at home, and, and there, there's a lot of benefits to being at home. You know, you can watch it with your family. You can, you know, you can, you know eat popcorn or whatever you want to do until your favorite beverage. You don't have to worry about a fear of COVID or something like that. Right. This is a time where safety and security and health is, is more important than the game. Let's fast forward one year to, to 21. Mm-hmm. Are people going to come out to these games if they find that they enjoy it? You know, if they enjoy the fan, still the fan, family atmosphere, but hey, I can do it on my couch. Baseball has a lot to lose from this, don't they? They do, but not only for that reason. I think in 2021, 
you're still going to have people nervous in crowds. Oh, I do too. And they're not going to go, not because they got used to watching it on TV, but because they don't want to be sitting next to a whole bunch of people. So mm-hmm. baseball is definitely going to take an attendance in 2021 and possibly 2022. That would be awful. That would really be yeah, awful. I think the one thing I should point out too, though, now that you bring that up, I like the Dave versus Glider math. Remember, I'm talking mm-hmm. about many years ago, I remember watching the Miami Marlins and the Fort Lauderdale Yankees. Back then, though, we had the Florida Marlins and the New York Yankees. Just a little bit of South Florida trivia. But you remember in 2021, though, you're also dealing with a potential labor situation the last year of a collective bargaining agreement. So between the bad taste yeah. that was left during this process to get to 60 games, will the fans have a more bitter taste because of the collective bargaining agreement or the potential issues of being nervous? I mean, this is a double-edged sword. It really, really is. I, I think baseball, you know, Obviously, if they can't, if there are problems next year between the owners and the playoffs, players, that's going to leave a bad taste. Oh, yeah. This year, I know there were issues before the season is starting. But, guys, the reality is they weren't going to play more than 60 games anyway, the right. way things are playing out. So I, I don't think you right now you hear anything about the struggles they had a month ago. Right. You know, now it's we're getting ready to start the season you know, players are opting out, players are getting sick, which is what you would have had regardless. Next year, if thing, if hopefully this thing is, is, well, maybe not necessarily gone away, that's not a good choice of words, but if, if it's kind of subsided a little bit and now you have labor problems, that's going to be really bad because if things are somewhat back to normal, baseball needs a full 162 game season with no labor issues whatsoever. Right. Yeah, they get a mulligan right now based on the situation because they are, or we are set to go 60 postseason. I get that. And you know, you guys alluded to something and I'll expand on that. You're right. The MLB marketing department is going to have a lot of work to do in so many different fronts, whether it's marketing the big guy versus the little guy, marketing the stars, depending on which ones are there. And yes, I believe there will be more players that are opting out. Mike Trout, obviously we had Ryan Zimmerman. Uh, has already talked about it. I know more of them. I'm probably forgetting a few of them. But those are just to name a couple. Nick Markakis, I think, decided he doesn't want to play. And the beat right. goes on and on. And Nick Markakis was an interesting... Did he decide he didn't want to play not because he was uncomfortable, because he didn't want to play in front of no fans? No. What happened... And I, Well, actually, that might have been part of it. But I do know that when... Um, for, uh, was it Freddie Freeman? Yeah, but he tested positive... Up. They had a, he had a telephone conversation with Nick and, uh, basically Nick laid it all, uh, uh, sorry, Freddie laid it all out for him and then Nick made a decision. Okay. And, and by the way, you and I also know this. We all three know this. Guys talk. You know, I'm on the phone and, you know, I'm, I'm player A and I'm talking to player B and, and man, I'm really scared about this. You know, I, I got a family, I got kids, I got a, you know, a wife is pregnant, I, you know, all these things can happen. Yeah, you know, changing my mind. You're this. You're, you know, you know what I mean. It's 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 a change. It's a, it's it's a it's a great line. And we're going to see players opt out for those reasons as well. Well, I talked to so and so, and he's not doing it, so I'm not doing it. Uh, this is a it's a it's a real bad look right now. I think. Now, do you see players deciding mid season that? You know, I gave it a shot. I played 20 games, 30 games. I'm just not comfortable. I'm going home. I that do. was my question for you next. <laughs> I, well, let me let me answer that on my end. I actually do think that that could happen, Stuart. I, go ahead, David. No, no. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, go I can see that. Again, we're talking about a lot of different unknowns. And let me uh, answer that question by going over some things that I've picked up on these last couple Zoom calls. Uh, with the Marlins. And yes, folks, I'm learning how to do Zoom calls is one thing, but for me to do Zoom calls with the Marlins, I feel like a kid out of a candy store doing all the conventional things here from my desk. Can you believe that? Me sitting in a Zoom call asking these questions and getting excited about that. So for all you technology people that want to pick on me, do it with the Zoom calls. But to answer some of those questions that you guys are bringing up, I was talking to Don Manningly and asking him a few things. One, okay, he addressed certain fronts at yesterday's conference. 
he knows that there's that the numbers are going to be strange, but he says that uh, winning a championship would still be meaningful. And he also pointed out that College World Series doesn't have a lot of games. You know, obviously the college season is a lot different than uh, MLB. And he feels right now his pitchers have built up enough to throw 75 to 80 pitches and they've stayed in shape. And he also indicated there's no plans to use a six-man rotation. Uh, but he also cited that other teams could use it. And he also... Uh, uh, based everything on 162 game schedule. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, Don isn't worried about that. Now, when I asked him the question about t- today, about the rising numbers in South Florida, you know, he didn't dodge that. And he said that they do pay attention to the numbers in the area, that they do everything in their can- power in the community, you know, to try to enforce mm-hmm. goodwill to stay in and enforce it. But they're testing every other day and don't think that this guy, uh, Don Manningly isn't thinking about, you know, what could happen anywhere along the way with the expanded rosters and he decided on his roster. But, you know, he is counting his addition by subtraction with everything that's going on. And while I let you guys get back on track, I had no choice because you guys motivated me here. I had to ask him about that perfect game question that Stuart hit us with, okay? And he says it would be a perfect game because it isn't the pitcher's fault. Now, Okay, then I I still it's not a perfect game. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? What what if what if the guy has a perfect game and then there's a ground ball in the second and it goes through his legs? It's not the pitcher's fault either, but it's not a perfect game. Well, I didn't hit him on that yeah. level. I only had so much time before they mute me if I went any further. They only had so much time for the guy. But no, I tried to get to the gist of the question. Doesn't mean that there aren't any intangible factors about it went through the guy's leg and all of a sudden it goes. We're talking about it, it if you start with a man on second base, right? And then he doesn't count that against a pitcher. They should get a perfect game. Mind you, the Marlins have had perfect games in their history. Can't say that about the San Diego Padres and the New York Mets who have struggled in those types of uh, historical moments. You know what I mean? So, But, he, yeah, to answer the age-old question that we've had the last couple of weeks, he says it would be a perfect game in his eyes. Uh, and he said yes. So there, I got it to him. I don't know of any other better source. I don't have a score. Well, you know, when, when, he, when he answered your question, was he smiling? You know what? He said it. He was. He said, that's a great question. And I had, he but said to so me. Don Mattingly doesn't smile when he does his remote. Oh, he when did he this time because he didn't, because that was a curveball I threw him. <laughs> Let me tell you, I got so hyper that they had to mute me toward the end. I was on such a roll. But the, the PR guy was nice. He just said I ran out of time. But Don Manning really loved the question. If body language could kill, the, because that's a question he doesn't hear all the time, except for the meaningful yeah, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to have to go pull up the video. What's that? I'm going to have to go and pull up the video. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, he was pretty enthusiastic. Is, that was one of my next, most. The next Zoom invite, if they give Scott the wrong password to get on, Exactly. Then, we know they, then we know they didn't like the question. Oh, no, he liked it. I mean, now, I got my Zoom in, but I hope they don't go ahead and give me the wrong one because I was I won't ask him that question sure. again. I got my bank sure. for my buck there. Yeah. No, but... but it, the world according to Scott. Well, hey, listen, all I can tell you, let me tell you, if anything comes out of that conversation, guys, that was a, that was a very animated conversation that he really, it made him think for a change instead of having to ask the all obvious questions okay. that really beat by your I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of you that you got it out there. I really am. That 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 took initiative, and that you know you were able to get him to talk. But usually, when when Donnie Baseball is on these things, he is stoic as anybody. <laughs> he won that time. He actually showed some emotion on that one because he yeah. didn't see that one coming. Um, In fact, I'll even take it a step I, further. You know, he was asked about the tenth inning from uh, Craig Minervini about the last out. Uh, uh, right. during the previous innings, and he said he would run with them with a previous runner, in, you know, uh, in the ninth inning. So, Sorry. you know, there's some little idiosyncrasies about this tenth inning previous runner and all that stuff. I don't know. All I can tell you, he, he we had a very interesting, colorful discussion, and how you guys want to break it down when you look at over eleven, that's up to you. But I did what you guys asked me to do and get that question out there that somebody was more qualified than us to answer it. I love this image of Scott, like you know, in school 
you know, oh, 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 can I answer it? Can I answer it? I can ask a question. I can ask a question. <laughs> Let me tell you, you got to understand how tough, tough it is. I'm not used to raising my hand in a Zoom call and hoping that the guy over at the front will pick on me, even though I'm getting animated on the screen where they got to let me get it out. This Zoom call stuff is different stuff for me. I, I didn't learn anything oh, about this. Now, are, now, are, you actually, are you actually raising your hand or you know to hit the button? Well, I know to hit the button, but I decided to make for good measure that they'd see me raise it anyways. I don't know whether you saw that. I've been in some calls where there's an older person and they're raising their hand and they don't understand well, why they're not getting called on. Well, let me tell you, I right. was raising my yeah. hand, but I do have the body language and I make sure I'm one of the first people on the Zoom call so the guy has to see me. So I'm figuring that part out. I've learned it with my family in-laws up in Wisconsin and Tennessee. I'm getting better at oh, it with God. these networking meetings. So by the time the Marlins got around to me, I was getting even better. And like Candy I, said when I was nervous yesterday about I, going, I felt like a kid on a candy store so much, I raved about this on No Limits last night. I had so much fun with this. I can't. I, I can't. I can't get that image out of my head. Okay. I'll bet you um, can. And, we'll and Candy's cool. laughing. She's turning red right now. She's a Wisconsin girl. She's a treat head looking like an apple. But anyways, I just thought I'd get that out there. I hope you guys didn't lose your hearing over that display. No, we're yeah. good. Wait, okay. Go ahead, I'm, David. I'm agreeing with, with I'm agreeing with what you guys are saying about how this is going to develop. And remember, too, that this is a test case. I don't really look at the NBA or the NHL as the um, as a starting point for people to follow. Maybe the NHL because of the conditions that we've talked about, where there, there's more protection, they're in, in uniforms, it's it's cold, it's all these things, and they're going to play they're going to play hockey. But I am also aware of the fact that if, if baseball can make this work for sixty games and they can make the playoffs work, then it benefits the NFL quite a bit because the NFL is, is studying everything. And the NFL, just like Manually said, they're constantly wanting to know what's going on, what the rates are of, of cases in their cities, how how social distancing is working and all these things. Baseball has a chance to either make this work and look really good or it has a chance for it to completely flop. And then they're set back another step. I mean, I mean, the NFL is almost like, and this goes back years, baseball is like Windows 3.0, the NFL would be 3.1 where they can make improvements yeah. Yeah. over yeah. what they've seen. <clears throat> right. your analogy, Stuart. That's good. Yeah. Do you... Um, okay, Crystal Ball, this. Do you think that there's going to be a lot of major stars that are going to opt out of this? No, not, not at first. I think they're... Despite... I think Mike Trout will start the season at least, you know, with the intention of playing a full season. I think... For now, especially with two weeks to go, I don't mm-hmm. think you're going to really see players drop out at the at the twenty uh, third hour. I think at this yeah. point, if if they're in, they've kind of seen the conditions. They may not be a hundred percent comfortable, but they're going to at least give it a shot. So I don't okay. think, at least right now, we're going to see any <clears throat> any other major names or any names of no drop out you know at this point you know once the season starts it could be a different story if someone's not comfortable with something's happening or if a couple of players test positive and you know teammates all of a sudden feel uncomfortable even if they have negative tests then you might see more drop out once the season starts but i think now we're at a point where for the most part, I think everyone's going to stay as is. If they're in, they're in for now. Yeah, you know, I agree with that. I know David Price dropped out. You know, of course, it didn't hurt that he had enough money that he could afford to skip 60 games anyways. But I, I want to just tell you a little something about the media policy. So I was really uh, talking to one of their PR guys, and some of their uh, PR guys, are, their PR people are really nice. But what they're playing for the media, just so you know, is that uh, everything this year is going to be done via the Zoom, and there won't be any in-person coverage of games this year because of the large gatherings sort of thing, even with us. So Now, again, whether or not they have the extent of their media or just the TV people only is another story, but the majority of us aren't going to be going to Marlins Park at all. So I just want to make sure that for those individuals who wonder about the media, which is fine with me, you know, I, I don't mind waiting until 2021 because, let's face it, the hotbed in... Broward, Dade, and uh, Palm Beach counties doesn't make me feel comfortable about going there anyhow. But they're they're very conscious about the media situation, making sure they do all of it on Zoom, and only the very essentials have to do it. And there's another thing that has that has uh, been happening around MLB, where a lot of the road 
home and, uh, around a lot of announcers will not travel on the road. It'll just be the uh, so you'll see a lot more remote announcing uh, around baseball this year, unless they were to drive and drive in separate cars, which I find it hard to believe. And, and I think, and I think even some of the announcers are going to like. I, I heard an interview with uh, Susan Waldman, who does the Yankee games with John Sterling, mm-hmm. and they will. I don't believe they're going to be in the same room together. They, they, no, they're going to be they're going to be next in adjacent rooms, I believe, but they right. will not be. You know, they they won't be able to see each other. Right, it's connecting room of some sort. Let me ask you this, Scott, because you you brought it up, and both of you guys, if huh. you'll, you'll answer, give me your opinion. Here's the question: I'm thinking. The Dodgers make the playoffs. Okay, Clayton Kershaw is still Clayton Kershaw. Right. They get to the World Series again, and they lose again. And then somebody says, "If David Price was there, we wouldn't have lost." Mm-hmm. Where? What? When does the backlash begin? You know, I think that, that just becomes as similar as if a key player gets hurt. You know, the analogy of Kevin Durant getting hurt last year in the finals. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, I you know. David Price wasn't wouldn't have been there the whole season, and they still made the World Series. So I don't think that's going to be as big of an issue now. If David Price pitches the regular season, and then says, "You know, guys, I know we're in the playoffs, but I just don't feel comfortable with this. I'm out." Mm-hmm. Then you could say, "Well, if we had David Price, you saw what he did during the regular season. You know, look what he could have done to help the Dodgers win the World Series, and he wasn't there. Then that's one thing." But I don't think you'll hear that, especially if they've missed the whole season anyway. I mean, if the Dodgers missed the playoffs, there's more of a chance of someone saying, well, if they had David Price, things might have been different. Right. I see some snow doing that no matter what, honestly. Yeah. That's just America. That's America. Well, you know, David, I got to tell you, I agree with Stuart a thousand percent on this one. I really do. I don't have a lot to say. I mean, right now you're talking about a 60 game season. You're talking about a manager the other day, like I just mentioned before, when he looked at the season, okay, that he realizes that I'll take a championship any way I can get it, even if it's 60 games. But yet, by the same token, okay, the accomplishment, accomplishment's going to be diminished. The Dodgers will be off the hook when they can win a championship with 162 games. I don't think anybody's worried about 60. Because, again, you guys bring up the David and Goliath theory, and that's going to be the, you know, the words that we obviously have to make sure that we're familiar with, that we all, we, it's our sprint marathon. Let's not lose sight of sprint marathon here, especially in a shortened season like this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't think that the Do- I think the Dodgers, like, the word mulligan should be a common word that we use there in a lot of ways. I mean, because you're talking about the fact that you give the players a pass because of the 60 game, no big deal. Sprint marathon, you get the same thing. So I, I think that there's some common denominators there. You got anything, Scott? Because I, I'm going to hold up. Do you want me to at least introduce? Yeah, I think you should. You yeah, I think we okay. should get into it a little bit, okay. uh, and then we'll uh, okay. and then we'll get into more detail next week about it because I think this is a subject that will give our listeners an opportunity right. to think about. We've we've danced around it a little bit, and I know as time progresses and everything, the Detroit Tigers uh, announced this week that they were. Uh, basically getting into bed with betting. You know, uh, points bet is a gaming partner of the Twins, which, uh, sorry, the Tigers, which is going to allow people to place bets during games, before games, after games, and it's generally going to affect the way we look at Major League Baseball. I'm not sure I agree with it. I, I did a lot of reading on it before we, we got on the air, and I see that it probably is going to become more of an eyesore and a problem than it is something that we could look forward to. Do you think betting is finally going to shape the way we look at Major League Baseball? I think it could because it, it'll almost come out of desperation because especially if you have mm-hmm. this year and if you have labor issues, Major League Baseball is going to have to do something to pique right. fans' interest. You know, going back, you know, I alluded to the XFL before the first version of the XFL was doomed from the start as far as I'm concerned because Vegas wouldn't pick up any of the games as far as you couldn't bet on them you know because they felt Vince McMahon you know was a wrestling guy and wrestling is fixed so these games have to be fixed so we're not taking any action on them And, and basically the XFL was doomed so now baseball realizing they need some sort of kickstart 
they're, they're, they're going to look to gambling. And, and I don't, I'm not overly comfortable with that either, but I have a feeling that it's going to happen. Okay. Scott, what do you think? Well, I, I'm with you. I, right now, at a time where money, everybody's desperate across the board from every sport on the planet, college, football, the NFL, if you can find a different revenue stream, you do it, especially during desperate times. Now, let me ask you this question, Stuart. And David asked me when Detroit became a big market team versus when they did not. And the only name that stood out to me was Mike Illich because he would spend until there was no end tomorrow. And you being a hockey guy, a New York guy, he's, he bought championships with the uh, Red Wings. Of course, uh, they did win one during the salary cap era. But what do you classify as a big market team versus a small market team? I don't think the Tigers are still a small market team. They're a rebuilding team, but I think the Tigers can easily go back to big market. It just so happens that Chris Illich went ahead and inherited a, an aging roster. But, you know, do you cons- first of all, they, uh, Stuart, do you think the Tigers are a big market team or a small market team? Um, you know, I don't see a lot of them, you know, being on the East Coast at this right. point. Mm-hmm. Um, even when they were, you know, in the 1980s when they had Sparky Anderson, honestly, I didn't think of them as a big market team. They had guys like Whitaker and Trammell who came up through the farm system. It wasn't right. guys, it was just, it was just smart drafting. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the players, Kirk mm-hmm. Gibson, these were homegrown guys that were the stars of these great teams. It wasn't the situation like the Yankees here where, you know, they would sign free agents and, and spend all this money and, and players would come here and that was a big market. I, I never looked at the Tigers as a big market organization. I looked at them more as a smart organization, you know, based on the moves that they made. You know, I, it, I never thought of them as spending a lot of money, but they made good, good moves with what they had. Yeah, now, with all due respect with Mike Gillich, I, I guess the best way I can say they are big market wannabe only because of Mike Gillich, but now under Chris Gillich and Ron Garden Hire and Al Avila, okay, now they're doing exactly what they did back in the late 70s and 80s. I know Ralph Hawk was a Oh, the veteran manager, you being a Yankee guy, uh, ought to know, was the master behind, behind the rebuild that Sparky Anderson took to the next level. And now Ron Gardenhire is doing the dirty work for the next guy that's going to replace him, too. So I see definitely a similar pattern between that. Uh, David, do you want to interject actually, on that? Actually, I'm more of a net guy. Oh, well, all right, well. Right. Okay. Well, well, well I, I don't know what to say there, but I, I guess. If you think about it, it doesn't necessarily, and maybe I worded it wrong. It okay. doesn't necessarily have to be a big market team. The St. Louis Cardinals, I guess, could be the same thing. They're the, the National League version of the Detroit right. Right. Tigers because they they follow the path of building through the organization. St. Louis is a great market for sports, but it's not huge. Um, and they have other things to compete with. Plus, they've also got the Royals to compete with, which is you know straight, straight down the freeway. So if you are... If you're good at filling your, your minor league system and you're making shrewd moves and you're saving money, then maybe you aren't a big market team or a small market team. You're just a smart market team. And maybe that's what we should look at. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, agree. I totally agree. Yeah. Well, Which I'm hoping now that means the Marlins are going to do that in the next couple of years because they're trying like hell to do it. <laughs> yeah, but but again, the Marlins, though, to their credit, okay, I've been around them as long as you guys have or at least been in the area, but Derek Jeter Great. is trying to go ahead and utilize the formula that enabled the Yankees to become a dynasty uh, under Brian Cashman. Now, yeah, you're right, Stuart, you are a Mets guy, but I think you could certainly, knowing that you're from the greater metropolitan New York area, certainly understood uh, the difference between the Yankees and how the Mets went ahead and operated differently for sure. You know what I mean? And, and you know, to, to the Yankees' credit, in the 90s, when they had their run, they did it with a lot of homegrown, you know, the Derek Jeters and the right. Bernie Williams came up through the system. They weren't like big name free agents that they took right off the bat. The Mariano Rivera's, they came up through the system. So the Yankees did it smart as well. You know, so they're... So there's a, you know, there's a perception maybe similar to the Tigers in, you know, 10, 15 years before that, you know, it wasn't necessarily the big name that they just threw a lot of money on. You know, obviously to keep these guys once they were eligible for free agency, the Yankees probably had more resources 
to keep him than maybe another well, team would have that brought him, you know, through. That's because Steinbrenner didn't mind paying the luxury tax that went along with it, that he was going right. to keep key players. And, and yes, and, and I've seen it, like Scott had said, Derek Jeter is taking the Brian Cashman How to Build a Franchise uh, textbook, and he's following it to a T. And for everybody who is, like, poo-pooing what they're doing right now, and I know that there are, you know, thousands of fans down in South Florida who have been crying for a playoff team and, and want to see success, this team's going to be successful in five years, and it's going to be winning World Series titles, and people are going to be like, he knew what he was doing. I, I think that it's just it's the same blueprint. Well, I'll tell you what, he had a lot of guts trading Giancarlo Stan, but he found a taker with the Yankees to do it. Uh, they had the market, the resources to do it. And yeah, everybody knows that George Steinbrenner used to trade away all of his prospects to win now, and that worked and that got him championships, but now you're mm-hmm. right. But then again, like you guys have talked about, the Yankees got it right by building from within and home growing, home growing their players. I still think that's the best way to do it long term, and more and more teams are enduring the rebuilds, going you're going to lose a lot of games, but then the long term dividends are better when it's all said and done. So I can understand both sides. It's painful when you go through a rebuild, but you reap from the benefits long term, especially when you're getting these premium number one picks, top picks. Now, now let me let me ask you guys yeah. something with the Marlins. So the Marlins have two world championships under their belt. Right. Both times right after they basically sold the team. You know, they Yeah, they gutted they, the team. They gutted the team, yes. They they gutted the team right away. You know, they didn't even try and repeat. Now let's say Derek Cheater has the right formula, he brings in these young players, three, four years from now, they make it to the World Series, maybe even win it. Will this be different? Can I answer that? Go ahead, and then I'll follow up. I'm yeah, curious it, what you're saying. It will be different, and I'll, t- I'll tell you why. Jeffrey Luria didn't give a darn about that team. He traded away prospect after prospect after prospect. He engineered a deal where um, Dave Sampson signed John Carlos Sam the $325 million contract that they knew they could not, could not pay. Uh, he was bleeding money, and the investors who were helping him were bleeding as well and they wanted out. This is a structure that is, and I hate to say it, Yankees strong from top to bottom. The the infrastructure and the people who invested in it saw the blueprint and saw that the, the management team is a lot more committed to waiting its time to build the winner. These players who are coming up through the minor league system, remember, they, they do have talent on the roster already. Brian Anderson is it should, if it was an 162 game season, he'd be an all star this year. They've got pitching that is that they thought was going to be okay. That has turned out really good. They made some really good trades. You know, Caleb Smith came in, and then they, they traded for Alcantara, where they gave up uh, uh, Marcelo Zuna. This team was a, a team with uh, Yelich and, and Stanton and Ozuna and JT Real Muto. They were all stars, but they were individuals. There was never any team chemistry. And that's why it's different. All these players that are coming up together, they're buying into what they're, you know, what this program is. And if they continue to buy into it, they're going to have multiple rings on their fingers. You know what? Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, I think Jared Jeter will retain. The, the one thing that Marlins really sorely lack is the ability to keep guys without having a fire sale every five seconds when something goes wrong. I mean, Jeffrey Loria is a snake, okay? He fleeced the city of Miami to build that stadium, and everybody knows about right. that. I don't have to get into the details. But you talk about a fleece job. That was definitely one of them for taxpayers to put that stadium in an area which is difficult for the whole tri-county area to even get to. And then he thought by being able to get people there, he'd overspend. He brings in Ozzy Gian, who obviously got run out of town for reasons which I don't care to mention on this broadcast, okay? Right. And then, but all of a sudden, you know, you bring in a new stadium. I got a new toy. Let me buy a couple players. And all of a sudden, it goes south very quickly. And all of a sudden, you got a delusional fan base. Uh Uh-oh, not again. And now Jeter inherits this mess, and he has to get rid of Stanton. So, yeah, I, I definitely feel it would be different because he comes from an organization that was stable with the Steinbrenner family, leading with George, and then carrying on to Hal, and he's taking the same blueprint and duplicate, duplicating it all over again. 
Now, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate here. Okay. The situation could be, can baseball survive in South Florida? So he could build the franchise the way he wants to, get the right players to buy into the system. They can maybe win a championship. But if, and, and this is before COVID, you know, the fans aren't coming. You know, they still have to, you know, they still have to pay their bills. And right. these guys, the guys they have now, they, the young players, they become names and now they're eligible for free agency and they need the money to pay them. And they're not getting gate receipts. And, and that may have been part of the issue for the other two mm-hmm. championship teams. They just, they weren't drawing. I had a friend who had season tickets for the Marlins when the Marlins made the playoffs in 97. When they won the championship, the first round, I think they played San Francisco. Oh, that I, was, game. I was still in New York. Right. He was telling me he couldn't make it because of a work thing. He couldn't give the tickets away to a playoff game. You know, and, and that, I believe that was the first playoff game in their history, and he couldn't get rid of them. I'm going to throw something at you, then, and hear me out on this one. Okay. Sure. Okay, Miami is a lot like Los Angeles. There are other things to do than to watch sports. And while the Dodgers and the Lakers continue, continue to sell out, because they're the two prime, you know, football didn't always sell out in Los Angeles. The Raiders didn't always sell out when they were in L.A. The Rams didn't either. The Dolphins are in a rebuild. The Miami Heat look like they're going to be a, a team on the, on the rise in the next two or three years. I'm not sure about hockey. You guys will have to tell me about that because I don't follow it enough. But if the Marlins start winning and all four of those majors start to build, the other sports that are successful will help the Marlins be successful as well because they're not going to let one of the major four fall off. Also, MLB did everything they could to make sure that Derek Jeter got that team. They wanted Derek Jeter involved in this. Remember, it was Jeff Bush was pushing to be the owner of this team. He right. backed, he fell, he backed out because Major League Baseball did everything they, they they wanted the rock star. They wanted his smile. They wanted, you know, the captain. They wanted, you know, one of the great icons of the business to be involved in this baseball adventure. Right. So I don't see it I don't see it tanking. I see it getting better. The only thing I can say about this whole thing and I've said it before, that stadium is in the wrong location. Now, granted, back in the early days when the Dolphins right. were winning Super I, Bowls. I, I agree with you, Scott. Yeah, the, when the Dolphins were winning Super Bowls, you had 70,000. They were putting them in there. That was then, okay? Now, had that stadium been have been built anywhere than where it's at now, then I think you have a much better chance, okay, for the gate to become a lot. You'll, you'll be able to sell more tickets. You can put thirty, thirty-five thousand in a baseball stadium, not seventy thousand. But that stadium's in the worst location. I understand they got they got a sweet deal with the land. To me, the accessibility is for Miami. So if Derek Jeter's thinking, I'm going to try to build on a Latin dollar. That's great if you can do it. Now again, though, like you said, this is South Florida's a win. If you uh, if you don't win, we don't support. Maybe there's enough baseball fans that will do it. But if you but for me, because I'm a member of the media, if I have to go there, <coughs> excuse me, to go, I, that's fine. I've got to do it. But for the average individual to go down in that area on a daily basis, beautiful stadium, wrong location, thirty thirty five thousand seat stadium, anywhere but there. And, and I, I wouldn't disagree with you either. I'm in Palm Beach County, right? And when they, and when they were playing in the football stadium, I would go for like five, six games a year. You know, it took mm-hmm. me, you know, maybe less than an hour to get there. Right. They moved to the stadium in 2012, I believe, was the first year they were there. Right. I've been to one game. Yeah, I think so. So you made my and, point and the for issue me. issue is in, in Palm Beach County, you have the Florida summer. So let's say that mm-hmm. there's a game, and then you get one of those thunderstorms like three, four o'clock. Like you're thinking of going to the game and then all of a sudden the sky's opening up and starts pulling. The sun may come out in 20 minutes right after that, but you know, you probably already made your decision. You're not going that night. And I think they lost a lot of fans, at least in Palm Beach County, as far as attending the game. Well, I agree. Yeah. How about Broward? Think about two, if you don't mind real quick, and and then I'll let Scott, you can have the board. When they, 
when Peter took over the day-to-day operations, the first thing he said was he wanted to make going to the baseball game a destination. Not just to watch the game, but because it's South Florida. It's colorful. It's vibrant. It's, you know, I want all the girls in the bikinis, and I, or, you know, girls in their summer dresses. I want people to be there so that they can enjoy an atmosphere, nightlife, baseball, taking it all in. He's got an idea for that area. That it's, it's not just a baseball game. And I think he went about it the right way because the first thing he did was he appealed to the Latino community because he knew that the Latinos needed an identity with baseball because for so long they've been crying for it. So he went out and he, and he went to the international market and he, he found the Mesa brothers and he brought, you know, other players in that are developing that have a strong tie to the Cuban and Latino community. He did it the right way. I just think it's going to take a little bit longer than they thought for it to be successful. Well, you know, I mean, let's remember the Miami Heat, right? Uh, play what in base uh, by the Bayside area, right by the cruise ships. Is that right in downtown Miami? And they made it an event there, okay. and they're able to bring in what eighteen, twenty thousand strong over. It was at the American Airlines Arena, you know, unless they're changing. I don't know, but nevertheless, down mm-hmm. there. So it's not like downtown Miami can't draw because the population base is there. You're talking what, I believe the Marlins Park is over at what, Little Havana? I guess it's not all that far away. But again... It's not, it's not that far away. Right, I think it's like 10 or 15 minutes, depending on traffic. But again, the, you're talking 18,000. It's a beautiful area anyways by Bayside. I'd love to go there when I get the opportunity to go. But by the Orange Bowl and an area which isn't overly that great, I don't know what you have in terms of nightlife there. I haven't been there much. I only go there to and from the games anyhow. Again, I'm just going to say this, and I'll say it until I'm blue in the face, okay? Location, location, location. Now, to Derek Jeter's credit, he knows, as they would say, what hand he's been dealt. If I've got to appeal to the Latin community, I will. If he can get even five or 10,000 people to go down there and they're winning, then maybe Derek Jeter makes us all look like a bunch of idiots and proves all of us wrong. But in terms of location-wise, you know, you're still missing two counties north. And that's why I like the fact that the Florida Panthers, if they ever get it figured out, to me will sell this place out all day long because they are a lot more accessible to Broward. They are in Broward, Dade, and Palm Beach County. I like where the Florida Panthers are at. And Broward, of course, it doesn't hurt them only 20 minutes away up to Sawgrass Expressway either. But location-wise, the Panthers got it right. I'm not so sure about the Marlins, but please prove me wrong. But I think if anybody can get get it worked out and. Uh, that area, Derek Jeter, I wouldn't bet against him at all. No way. And how great would it be, and I, I have a feeling it's a long shot, if A-Rod bought the Mets and they were in the same division? I still think that's going to happen. I'm not so sure that's a long shot, Stuart. I'm really not. Yeah, I think that's going to, I really think that's going to happen. And, and the, the reason and what why I'm hearing here, um, Steve Cohn is back in the picture. Is he? Oh, really? He, and he really wants the team. You know, and especially with the negotiations from last time, the fact that he's still interested and is preparing a bid, um, I think he's going to ultimately end up getting the getting the team. I, I don't view that as a long shot, Stuart. My gut feeling is you're probably right on that. I mean, let's say something. You had the Alex Rodriguez versus Derek Jeter again, the New York thing. Of course, it didn't hurt that they won a ring together, but that's beside the point. But, yeah, there's a little competition there. Now, how Alex Rodriguez does in the front office is another story. For your sake, you probably better hope that he does well since he's on your team. I got to mention something that you really got to me this week, okay? You nominated me for this picture thing that I'm on the hook for 10 days. And because I knew you were coming on the broadcast today, I had to put Willie Randolph on. So it's Willie Randolph. I, you know, I, I noticed that. I, yeah. I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. Hey, let me tell you a little Willie Randolph story. Many years ago when he was with your other favorite team, the Yankees, and I'm being really sarcastic since we've done a good job job here tonight. I wrote a story on Willie Randolph when he was with the Yankees for a, a weekly paper. Willie was one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. He really is. So uh, I've always viewed Willie Randolph as a Yankee, but you know what? You've had a lot of players that have played for the Mets and the Yankees back and forth, and we could probably devote another show to that. We'll actually do that one day, Stuart. This will be the Stuart Hack New York Mets show, New York show, and but you'll have to do the research about the crossover. How's that sound? Sure. All right? That's, that'd be great. You know, Willie Randolph, you know, when he managed the Mets, he got a raw deal at the end, honestly. Oh, yes, they, he did. 
they ended up firing him. They made him go out west. They made him travel out west on a road trip. And I think before he even managed a game out there, they basically took him off the team bus at three in the morning and, and said, you're gone. Um, oh. he, he, he didn't, he didn't deserve it. He, um, he had the beginnings, you know, he, he had had, um, in 05, 06, they were turning it around a little bit from the Art Howe years. I, he wasn't the greatest in game manager, but the players respected him because he was a winner. And he just, you know, it, they had the collapse at the end of, you know, those seasons, um, in, in 07 that didn't help. And I, I just thought he deserved a little better. I'm not saying they shouldn't have fired him, but the way it went down, I didn't think it was respectful. Well, I knew you were coming on the air tonight. That's why I put his picture. So I knew is it, is it, is he a Met or a Yankee? Now you want to talk about things like that. Lane Kiffin got fired right when he got off the plate over at USC and Gerard Gallant got this, uh, fired by the Panthers. Uh, unceremoniously as well. So this stuff does happen, whether you're on the plane or when you get home. Uh, things don't need you anymore. But yeah, Willie Randolph did get a raw deal. But I always look at the fact that he was such a great interview early in my journalism career and a class act. And I wanted to make sure, because you were coming on here, Mr. Hack, that <laughs> I was putting Willie Randolph nice. on something, knowing that you had, had already recruited me out for 10 days, putting this stuff up on Facebook. You know, you know someone, someone did it to me. I was just trying to pass it on. And you know what? I've actually okay, enjoyed well, it because there's a lot of photos well, I hadn't I put on I Facebook. Been, I haven't been tagged yet, and I'm very happy. Oh, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> you will. <laughs> don't worry. I, I, let me tell you what, Levin. I couldn't tag you when your dad's going through all these things, so I had to give you a break. So that's why I did. I got it. <laughs> I, but don't worry, you're, you're, you're one of the ten. But when Stuart Hack did this to me, I was looking for excuses to go ahead and get pictures on Facebook, and I couldn't think of a better way to do it than when Hack nominated me for this thing. So don't worry, uh, Levin. I haven't forgotten about you, yeah. but I couldn't do it when your dad's yeah, going through all medical of, all, problems. All of my pictures, all of my pictures, by the way, yeah. will be of Green Bay Packers, just to, just to make you happy. <laughs> no, well, it's but, candy. You know, I, I was, I tried to be a little creative with it. You know, one day I did um, Joey Chestnut. Did you really? Yeah, I saw that. I mean, major, major league eating. Well, I had another guy when I did this thing, Mike Del Pozo from my Coral Springs group, who's a, who's a uh, big New York uh, uh, fan as well. I don't know if he's a Mets or a Yankees, but he's a New Yorker. But I only put that on there because of you. And I figured I'd stroke Del Pozo's ego a little bit. That was definitely because of you. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. I don't care about what Mike ever says, but it, he did get a like out of this whole thing. But I've never, Stuart, this is a credit to our friendship, okay, have okay. ever got involved with one of these old uh, 10-day deals here where I'm obligated to write the stuff who <laughs> I did what? This is a one and done. Uh, let me tell you, and that's out of respect for you, Mister Hack, because you kindly take your time I, I on Thursday it. night this for the end of the This is the 2020 podcast. equivalent to the chain letter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes. You're so right. Don't worry, Levin. You know, I, I haven't forgotten you about, about you, man. You know, sit there. I got ten records that really affected my life. Really, come on. It's you, you know, know. I, I um. <laughs> I got nominated by a, a congressman, uh, by a councilman here in town, so I felt I had to do it. Um, you know, I did things like, um, there were obscure players like Yvonne de Jesus was an inside joke between a friend of mine and I growing up. So oh I put his picture in and nominated, that was the day I nominated my friend to do it. And, and I even said, we're probably the only ones that get this inside joke. Well, um, so I try, I try to do some sort of, like, you know, like Scott did today, some sort of connection. Well, the obscure journeyman who is at to Jesus. <laughs> well, see, you know what? I'm taking a page out of Brett Favre's book and waffling about who I want with David Levin. Now, for me to go out there yeah, and pin it. Lewis Eddie away with Barry Sanders, I don't care. I wanted Barry up there. I didn't really care. Okay, so that okay. was different. But, you know, Jeff Edelman, the other guy I put up there, I had to make sure he was a Gordy Howe guy because he's a Chicago Blackhawk, and he definitely, and Gordy Howe saw a lot of the Blackhawks. So I'm trying to strategically play certain people about where I want to put them. But don't worry, Levin. You know, I, I was showing a little soft side because your dad was sick. Okay. But, okay, Scott. Huh? We're good. Oh, We're no, good. we'll be good when I tag you, my friend. How, how, many, how many days do you have left, Scott? I've got five. Okay. Oh yeah. It's coming. It's coming. All right. So guys, um, let's uh, let's let's get back to business here. Okay. No uh, problem. Sorry to get off subject, things. but that's okay. Um, we got anything else going on that we want to talk about, or are we going to save the other stuff for uh, next week? What do you think, Stu? What other stuffs come up in MLB you want to talk about, buddy? 
Um, I guess you know we'll be a week closer to opening day next week, so so things may start to clear up or they may get a little bit more cloudy. It, it's kind of as the COVID turns. Yeah, well, it's kind of exciting though too in this in that case because you really don't know what's going to happen day to day. Yeah, I think the one thing I could probably maybe they should market it that way. Yeah, really, no kidding, day to day, right? Hey, go ahead and call them right now and do that, please. <laughs> well, let me tell you, try life a lot easier. <laughs> Between the betting thing that we're going to do, talk a lot more about next week, of course, it also begs that question about whether Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame based on points bet. I know we'll talk about it more detail, but, you know, based on this, do you think anybody will ever reconsider giving Rose or is he just out of there no matter what, even though now we have gambling into the picture? I think if he would have been contrite, yeah. if he would have admitted it sooner, I think if his disposition would have been better, I think baseball would have been more forgiving towards him. And yes, I think they definitely would have let him in, but he was very stubborn. Right. Um, and you know, and, and as a result, he probably will never get in. Or if he does, it'll be long after he's, he's left this, it'll be after he's left this earth. Yeah, he's dead. He's, he'll get in at some point after he passes away right. and on his tombstone it will say contrition and that's it if he had been you're right sort of so right but he said I did it it was wrong I shouldn't have done it I you know I, I apologize I still love the game he'd be in the Hall of Fame by now I think so too well, I know what I've got to look forward to other than points bet on next Thursday's broadcast is I'm going to go ahead and start piling up my Zoom meetings with the Marlins and see if I can come up with you some more that. substance. I will. I actually have a notebook there, taking legitimate notes, and I have to make sure I don't get muted again. But now that i got the main important questions, I'll be a really subdued individual if that's even possible. I don't even know. Whatever. Good job, guys. Really been Great. a lot of fun. Great uh, job. Oh, I can't yeah, wait to... So with that said, okay, why don't we go ahead and uh, let David Levin lead off in terms of how they get a hold of Mr. Levin. Sure. I uh, write for fansided.com. I cover the Miami Marlins on marlinmaniac.com. I also cover the Jacksonville Jaguars on blackandteal.com. If uh, you want to reach me on Twitter, I'm at DM719907. And I am the co-host with uh, Scott and Stuart here on Hunter Made Fitches. All right, Stuart, you're next. Okay, I am Stuart Hack. I am the managing member of Hack Tax and Accounting Services in Wellington, Florida. I, I have my Twitter is Hack Tax One. Um, my website is www.hacktaxandaccounting.com. I am also the immediate past president of the Wellington Chamber of Commerce as well as their treasurer. So I do things that are outside of baseball, although baseball was always my first love as a child. And I'm glad that you guys have given me the opportunity to talk about it on a weekly basis. Thank you. Oh, we love having you on there. Yeah, we got to look at our dynamic trio here with you on the Thursday broadcast, 108 Stitches Baseball Talk with myself and David Levin. But that said, okay, how you can get a hold of me? Numerous ways. We'll start with Twitter, at Tribune South. Facebook, if you're looking for the hat trick version, at South, yeah, South Florida Tribune on Facebook. Instagram, South Florida Tribune. Uh, YouTube channel, South Florida Tribune, will be a lot more active if COVID-19 ever behaves itself, which I'm not holding my breath anytime soon, but I'll still get it out there if I can remote, uh, find a remote area. Don't worry, it'll be more active. Website, www.southfloridatribune.com. You can email me at uh, southfloridatribune at gmail.com. LinkedIn, you can find me, Scott Morgan Roth, on LinkedIn. And, of course, you are listening to 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. And the WSAN network, and you can also find these broadcasts on SouthFordTribune.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, we have a lot to look forward to next Thursday. We'll talk more about the points bet, and I'll do it the best I can to compile up some meaty information from the Marlins and enjoy these Zoom calls and see what I can get out of them. And because I'm sure we'll get closer to some of the answers that we need. So on behalf of Stuart Hack and David Levin, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Manmouth, asking everybody out there to be safe, use common sense, social distance, don't take COVID-19 lightly. This is a very dangerous virus, and we don't want you to be on the wrong side of the st- stats. We talk about numbers, but don't be on the wrong side of these. Good night, everybody from all three of us. We'll catch you the next time.